It's here. Can't you feel it? This whole room. This, this. Everything is in color, and and I can feel the air. I can I can see it. I can see all the molecules. New Year's Eve, I was attending a party with friends and families, and at one point I was having a conversation with one of my father-in-law's friends. He's a 52-year-old gay man, and we were sort of shooting the shit about how things were for him, how the current climate was for gay people, basically. And he talked to me about how he had witnessed this roller coaster ride uh, in terms of progressive politics and in terms of, you know, gay rights acceptance. He had witnessed a Denmark which was completely devoid of any gay rights and people were vehemently against it. And he had witnessed how we were entering into these progressive times where everyone, capitalism as well, was in on gay rights. Everyone wanted gay rights to happen. Everyone wanted gay people to flourish and to be who they are. And now, he was telling me, right now, there was a counter-movement going on. People were not fond of gay people, and he told me he was sad to see the world go in that direction. And he, he told me at one point he was glad he was 52 years old, and I cut him off right there. I interrupted his speech, and I, and I asked him drunkenly, but still, it's a very valid question as well. I asked him, is it because you're going to die sooner than the rest of us? And he, right off the bat, he accepted it. He said, yes, it's because I'll be dead sooner. I am too scared to see the world. I'm too scared to see where it all ends. And for the first time in a very long time, I felt as if someone was actually telling me the truth. Someone was actually being brutally honest with me. And even though it was on such a sad note, it was still such a freeing and emancipatory thing. So today, I really want to talk about acid communism. As a communism is a term or a concept articulated first by Mark Fisher in the unfinished book by the same name. You know, the book is unfinished because he didn't get to finish it prior to his untimely death in January of 2017. But if you're very interested in acid communism and what it is, go to the K-Punk blog anthology and go to the last part, part 7, and that's where you'll be able to read the introduction. Now, as a communism itself is a new term, but it's something that crops up elsewhere in Mark Fisher's scattered writings. It's something he's been working on for quite some time before he actually wrote the book itself, or attempted to at least. So what it contains, and what it does, and what it is, what it stands for, all of that has been you know, something he's explored prior to just writing this book. And right off the bat, it's something interesting, right? It sounds funny in a way. You know, acid communism, that's a funny term. It's almost as funny as accelerationism, almost as funny as gothic Marxism. You know, there's a there, there's a crowd of people online who just like to work with these different <laughs> ideologies almost, which are so unheard of outside of the internet, right? So acid communism is a funny thing in that regard as well. You know, straight out of the gate, it's a misnomer, right? As a communism is a misnomer. It's an odd juxtaposition of two odd words that seems like they have been just haphazardly mishmashed together. You know, acid is not something we usually talk about in political discourse. It's something that is completely unpolitically charged in a way. You know, the adjective itself, at least. Of course, you can still look at certain contexts where it gets political even in this completely unpoliticized world. But usually it's something that doesn't have the political charge. And on the other hand, in terms of political discourse, communism has been completely banished from it. We talk about liberalism, we talk about socialism, we talk about democracy, but we don't really talk about communism, right? So both these words, they don't really get to enter into the political discourse, but they have been forced to do so by being combined in this manner. And I think that's what makes the term itself very interesting and something we are forced to look into and forced to journey into. So in their own way, these words don't really belong to the political discourse, but it's something that we are forced to engage with just because it's been placed you know, in front of us in this cyborgian way. It's this chimeric uh, connection between these two that makes it such a potent or potentially potent word, which is why I think it's actually a great combination of words as a communism. 
And it's also a contested term because Jeremy Gilbert, who was a friend of Mark Fisher and who is a political theorist in his own rights, he actually wrote an essay when this K-Punk anthology came out. And he, you know, he wasn't as clear as I'm about to be right now, but he <laughs> he is is basically disappointed that Mark Fisher stole everything as a communism stands for from Jeremy Gilbert. He didn't steal the word as a communism itself, but everything it contains, that's apparently something Jeremy Gilbert has been writing about for years before this book came out. And he talks about in this essay, and I'll link it in the show notes, he talks about how Mark Fisher read all these things that Jeremy Gilbert put forth and they had discussions. And all of these ideas that we would be talking about is something Mark Fisher apparently took from Jeremy Gilbert. I won't be commenting on it further because it, that's not really what acid communism is all about, but I, I encourage you guys to check it out for yourself. So that's why it's in the show notes. Let's get into the meat now. As a communism is something that has to be understood through its backdrop. And the backdrop is a specter of a world that could be free, which is a sentence or a phrasing Mark Fisher takes from the Frankfurt School philosopher Herbert Marcuse. You have to understand specter in a specific way here, because a specter is not just something that's left behind from something that is dead or long lost. It's actually an eerie entity in and of itself. It's something that impinges on the world without being fully present. And in this not fully being present, it's not fully absent either. It occupies this middle ground. And from this middle ground, it's able to influence and impinge on the world. You know, and this freedom is a freedom that is connected to the freedom from work and a freedom from oppressive hierarchies and a freedom from the exploitation that capitalism brings with it. Because capitalism has successfully suppressed the narratives that lay dormant in older times that could, you know, potentially bring bring about this completely free world. Capitalism has done a tremendous amount of PR work in 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 retelling old narratives. It's made you know it's made them reasonably unthinkable for people. When you think about the 60s and the 70s, they are completely as as Mark Fisher would have said, they're completely inseparable from this from their own simulation and the reduction to iconic images and classic music and a certain kind of nostalgia, all of these things has sort of neutralized the real promises that exploded in the 60s and the 70s. And all of that has come about capitalism, which has been able to retell stories in an oppressive way. And this is a point Mike Fisher makes as well. He says that the past is not something that has already happened. It's not something that floats about freely out there. It's rather something that has to be retold and repurposed and refashioned in various ways. And in a way, the past hasn't been fully actualized as well. It's something that is still virtual, but is continuously actualized through the stories we tell about it. And the 60s and 70s have more to them than just iconic images and hippies putting flowers down the barrels of guns. They tell a story about emancipation. It tells a story of a convergence of different forces that wanted to be free, but apparently didn't achieve this goal. So capitalism keeps these narratives from happening. It keeps revolutions and it keeps these revolts from happening by producing scarcity, both actual scarcity and artificial scarcity. So actual scarcity is the natural resources of the world. Capitalism keeps reproducing itself and in so doing, it ends up using up everything we have on the planet and it ends up making everything scarce again. And this is the real of capitalism. This is what it tries to avoid. This is what it tries to suppress in itself is the fact that it cannot go on forever because eventually it will have used up everything if it tries to do so and killing itself in this using of everything. So every single fantasy capitalism sets up is to suppress this notion of the world not being able to sufficiently fund capitalism itself. 
And in every single fantasy, capitalism is just able to go on indefinitely, which it is not. And if we look past this actual scarcity, there's also the artificial scarcity, which is the scarcity of time. And that is what distracts us from this imminent possibility of freedom. We are constantly asked to work, we are constantly asked to engage in our careers, we are constantly asked to keep ourselves busy. And that keeps us from producing freedom, that keeps us from thinking in these alternative ways. And this is exactly the point. What capitalism has succeeded in doing is to mire us all in capitalist realism. We are fundamentally incapable of thinking about any alternatives to capitalism itself. And the success here is that capitalism has been able to frame freedom differently from what it was originally. You know, usually we think about freedom from work, from this endless toiling we have to do. But with capitalism, we are taught to reframe freedom in a way. We are taught that we we can get freedom through working, you know, social mobility, more money, all of these things that make us fundamentally unfree. They are being sold to us as being something that gives us freedom. So this is the backdrop of asset communism. It's this capitalist realistic world where we are unable to to sort of get out of it. We are unable to imagine something else that may be better for us. And Mark Fisher actually has a great quote to sort of set the mood for asset communism. He says, What if the counterculture was only a stumbling beginning rather than the best that could be hoped for? What if the success of neoliberalism was not an indication of the inevitability of capitalism, but a testament to the scale of the threat posed by the spectre of a society which could be free? And that's exactly what neoliberalism is. It's this amazing ability to to suppress these new tellings, these new retellings of freedom. It's this amazing ability to to take every single act against the establishment and to render it pointless or to reduce it to something harmless. Neoliberalism is an amazing tool for defanging things. It's a way to sort of take the critical component out of a very critical idea. And this is exactly where the 60s and 70s come into the picture, because they were able to give us hope, to give us a sense of control, where we were told that we could bring about a new communist world, one which was fundamentally different from the capitalism we all lived under and still continue to live under today. It was such a joyful and magnificent time, and that has sort of been lost because of capitalist realism's PR work. Because neoliberalism installed a new kind of individualism. It was an individualism that was mandatory and it was defined against the different forms of collectivity we had prior to neoliberalism. We are forced to being individuals. We are completely atomized and are unable to think about collectivity without this loss of freedom. We think that every time we fall into the collectivist trap, we are fundamentally unsubjectivized or desubjectivized, but that's not the case. It is possible to be part of something bigger, part of a community, part of a collectivity without losing yourself in it. So as Mark Fisher writes, we don't have to remember the lost forms of collectivities. Rather, we have to unforget the individualism that is imposed on us right now. And by doing so, we'll finally be able to envision a world that could be free. Through the use of the word communism, Mark Fish is also trying to give the left a unified vision, a unified and concrete vision of a post-capitalism. And this makes it a fundamentally Marxist or leftist project, right? Because right now we have capitalism, which is so all-encompassing and so influential that we have to define everything around it. You know, pre-capitalism is so multiplicitous. It has things like primitive communism and it has things like feudalism. All of that is sort of, (laughs) you know, defined in relation to capitalism. And any vision and anything that comes after capitalism, let's stay optimistic and hope that something actually follows from capitalism, which is not capitalism itself or something worse than capitalism. But anything that follows from it has to be defined by its alterity to capitalism. It has to be defined by it being something else than capitalism. And the thing is that if you have a project called post-capitalism, you don't really have something that you can rally people around. 
It's such a vague and empty concept. No one's really going to feel anything when they hear it. But as a communism might just be that concept which makes us feel something again. So Mark Fisher gives the specter the name of asset communism, and in so doing, he's reminding us that it is a transitory concept rather than post-capitalism proper. It is an egress in and of itself. And I'll get back to this in a second, but that means you have to think about capitalism as an eternal inside where we are perpetually trapped. And outside of capitalism is this new world. It is this specter which haunts us right now. It is our ability to imagine again. It is the ability to see new possibilities and alternatives. So as a communism, something that can lead us to the limit between the inside and the outside, but it cannot be the outside itself because we are fundamentally unable to think about what it is and to imagine it. So we cannot imagine the outside, but we may be able to imagine a path that goes from the center of the inside to the outer border of it, and that path is as a communism. It's what leads us to the border, to the brink of the inside, without really going over to the outside as well. So it is a transitory project rather than post-capitalism proper. It has been said that some of you are communists. That is a very unpopular term today. So this is where we get to the crux of asset communism, and I'll just quote Mark Fisher directly. It points to something that, and it being asset communism, it points to something that at one point seemed inevitable, but which now appears impossible: the convergence of class consciousness, socialist feminist consciousness raising, and psychedelic consciousness, the fusion of new social movements with a communist project, an unprecedented aestheticization of everyday life. And this is exactly why the 60s and the 70s were so important to the Asset Communist Project, because they stood for, they represented, they gave way to this amazing convergence of consciousness, consciousness from different、um, starting points, but which still intertwine in the end. And this is what Mark Fisher talks about when he's referring to consciousness raising. It is a way for us to to sort of. Uh, realize and become aware of our own predicaments. We have to be made aware of the fact that we are being exploited by capitalism. We have to be made aware of the fact that we are being subjugated by the patriarchy. We have to be made aware of a new way of looking at things, a new ontology, and that's where psychedelia comes into the mix. Because psychedelia is this fundamental questioning of time and space. It's this. Fundamental rearrangement of our current ontology of our current experience. It is a way for us to to experience a new and different world which we couldn't before. And what the psychedelic community did so well back then in the sixties and the seventies was to mainstream these metaphysical questions. And this is where acid communism has sort of been hijacked or captured by the freak left, because. Fisher mentions psychedelics, but he expands the term, because what psychedelia fundamentally is is this questioning of our reality, and that is something drugs can do very well, absolutely. But it's something that comes across as well in mass media and in television and in our computers and in our smartphones as well. The thing with technology, with screens, is that they are able to contract time and space. Through the internet, we are able to have a conversation with someone who is miles away from us, even in a different time zone. So you have to think about psychedelia as this breaking down of time and space that is sort of occurring from both technology and from drugs as well. Virtual reality is possibly the convergence here. You can both be with someone who is far away, and you could just transcend time as well by being these avatars in a game. Right? If you've ever been to the VR chats. 
uh, that's exactly what it would be like. You'll all be different avatars coming together from across the world. And you don't need drugs for that to happen. You just need the ocular goggles. And another important thing which I'll get back to is the fusion of movements with a communist project. Because what went down in the 60s and 70s was that feminists and gay rights activists and students and workers all came together even though they had different struggles, they came together and realized their own plight and each other's plight as well. One thing Mark Fisher brings into play here is Michel Foucault's limit experience, which is an experience he's talking about that happens at and beyond the limits of ordinary experience. It is an experience of the outside. And that's exactly what we've been circling around, right? Capitalism is this inside, is this eternal, endless inside without horizons at all. And outside is completely inaccessible to us right now. And as a communism acts as this egress, this border between the inside and outside that allows us emancipation, that allows us to be free again. And Foucault is talking about this limit experience, and he talked about it in connection with LSD. He tried to take some acid, and he experienced the world fundamentally changing. Because by taking LSD, you move to the border, right? You are becoming aware of your situation, and you are becoming aware of the fact that you can change it. And that is exactly what's going on with our technologies as well, because drugs are able to unearth something within us that makes us see the world in a different light. But so is technology. You know, one of the things about capitalist realism is that we are fundamentally unable to envision a world that is not capitalistic. But with consciousness raising, with these limit experiences, they allow us to see that the world can change and that we can change with it. One thing that has been neglected in this reading of Hasse Communism is a term that Mark Fisher calls exorbitant sufficiency. And it's been neglected because he frames these moments of exorbitant sufficiency as being completely outside of capitalism. To Mark Fisher, it's not something that can be accessed from our end. We have to pierce through the inside to the outside in order to get these moments of exorbitant sufficiency. So that's why he analyzes books, and that's why he analyzes uh, music as well, because music from that time was able to capture this notion of exorbitant sufficiency that we are just simply not able to today. But I actually think that these moments can be designed and cultivated to be used in social spaces right now. So in order to actually get at what exorbitant sufficiency is, you know, you have to think about a time prior to postmodernism and neoliberalism, prior to the switch of the 70s, where things were actually feeling okay. So exorbitant sufficiency are basically these instances of optimism, of quiet optimism for the future. You know, we look to the world and we see something that actually gets better. You know, back then in the 60s, a lot of the people who were marginalized were seeing some success. They were because they, they had seen the amazing progressive strides politics had made just in a few years. And furthermore, they were feeling secure and safe in their current position. You know, this moment right now, you know, it didn't call for anything else. They didn't need anything else. They just, you know, if you were working class in the 60s and 70s, you could, you know, you were allowed to have these moments because you felt stable and secure in your current position. And again, you were feeling like the world could only get better from now on. And I agree, that's not how the times are today, not in the slightest. But I don't think the world is completely devoid of exorbitant sufficiency. For example, think about the time between Christmas and New Year's Eve, where time collapses completely, but in a good way. Everyone's just relaxing and enjoying the freedom to do anything they want, the freedom from work, the freedom from responsibilities. 
it's a time where you can just start drinking at 10 a.m. because why not? You don't have to get up for work the next day. You can just sort of do this. You're on a vacation. You're on a holiday. Because in this time, between Christmas and New Year's Eve, you just get to do you. You get to relax, kick back, and just float along. You know, today the ideas of floating along or just gliding downstream or being outside of work, you know, they are viewed with scorn. I agree completely. And the time between Christmas and New Year's Eve is, for now, unfortunately, something that only the middle class and the upper class get to experience. It's not something the working class get to experience at all. But politicians can sort of cultivate these moments of exorbitant sufficiency through legislation. They can pass bills which secures stability for working class people. You know, things like minimum wage bills or added holidays, or added maternal or paternal leave of some kind. All these small things add up in the end. They accumulate and at some point they can become huge political and parliamentary strides. But they don't detract from the overall goal as well. And these moments can be uh, cultivated through the non-parliamentary movements as well. And to give an example of this, I just want to quote from the K-Punk blog called Abandon Hope, Summer is Coming. And I'll just leave a link to it in the show notes. Mark Fisher writes, The roots of any successful struggle will come from people sharing their feelings, especially their feelings of misery and desperation, and together attributing the sources of these feelings to impersonal structures, albeit impersonal structures mediated by particular figures to which we must attach populist loathing. When you are in a movement, when you're part of something bigger, it is a moment of exorbitant sufficiency. It feels like you're doing actual good. It feels like you're pushing the world in a more positive direction. When I view old Occupy Wall Street videos, I get this sensation. I get the camaraderie from people. I feel it, even though I was not present there at all. And during the last Labour campaign, you know, on the leftist side, I really felt like I was contributing, without actually contributing, I guess, but I felt like I was contributing to something bigger, something more socialistic, something else than just endless austerity. And of course, things didn't go that way, at least not this time, but we got these feelings of exorbitant sufficiency. It's possible to achieve them and to unlock them in this age of capitalism. And this is something our current movement, they lack. And this is where we circle back to the fusion of current movements and communist projects. Because if you look at the climate movement, and if you look at the Yellow Vest movement, they they work fundamentally within the system. All of them lack this component of socialization. They work fundamentally within the system, and they don't aim or seek to change it, even slightly. They still believe in democracy and in capitalism, and that's exactly where this component of fusion between movements and communist projects, that's exactly where it comes in. Because if you fuse a current movement with a communist project, you not only get the critique of capitalism, you also get a vision of something better. I absolutely love and adore Greta Thunberg, and I think she's doing God's own work, but It's so frustrating to see her work within the system. It's so frustrating to see her mired in capitalist realism. You can see it with the Yellow Vests as well. They were trying to change the system. They, they, (laughs) They started all of their demonstrations because they lacked the fuel for their cars. And you can see it with these austerity movements in Spain and in Greece as well. For example, in Spain, you have the Podemos party, which has, uh, you know, a a not insignificant amount of voters and amount of mandates in the Spanish parliament. But that's just still working within the system in a way. Of course, they could still foster these moments of of, of exorbitant sufficiency through their legislation. And if they do so, all power to them. But there remains this unwillingness to work outside of the system itself. So we have to focus on the impersonal structures, the capitalism of the world. And we have to look at these structures being mediated by uh, particular figures, which we can attach populist loathing to. 
People like billionaires and millionaires, people like bankers and CEOs, and people like politicians, conservatives and libertarian, who still want to keep things the way they are right now. We have people in marketing who propagate the system through PR. We have landlords as well who exploit their tenants to the most ridiculous degree. These are the particular figures that mediate the current impersonal structures. Of course, all these things were crushed, Occupy Wall Street and Jeremy Corbyn as well. But they are moments of exorbitant sufficiency that get us just a tiny inch closer to the outside. So acid communism is a call for everyone within the left to work more experimentally, to work together and to socialize each other through the movements around us. We're not talking about a utopia here. We're not talking about a, a, an end destination. No. We're just talking about a path from the center of capitalism to the brink of it. We're just talking about a slight offsetting of capitalism. Asset communism is the very threshold of the new, and we must do everything we can to seep into it. So thank you so much for listening, and if you are interested, please do donate to the Patreon, patreon.com slash Simon because you will help support the show and help support myself as well. 